Hello, and thank you for joining me for the um, First Samuel chapter 13. First Samuel chapter 13, which talks about Saul and the war with the Philistines. And um, so we go ahead and read the passage and then go over the key points. The, the, uh, the passage is pretty straightforward. Um, there really isn't much to delve into, theologically speaking. Um, so we'll just talk, focus in on the fact that Saul, everything that he did in this passage was wrong. Everything that he did was foolish. So, in prayer we ask, may the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word, our Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm going to change the um, method of delivery here a little bit to sound more like perhaps a lecture or a talk. Kind of like um, some leaders have done in history past, speaking to the people of their nation, just to see if that doesn't, you know, captivate a little bit more uh, ability to focus, concentrate on what's being said. And I'll still get feisty at times when it's necessary, but uh, I'll just try it this one time and see how it goes. So Saul, Saul was 40 years old, 13 verse 1, when he began to reign, and he reigned 32 years over Israel. Now Saul chose for himself 3,000 men of Israel, of which 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash and the hill country of Bethel, while 1,000 were with Jonathan at Gebeah of Benjamin, but he sent away the rest of the people each to his tent. In verse 3, And Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. Then Saul blew the trumpet throughout the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. Now, so as is said, uh, Saul blew the trumpet throughout the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. Now, why would Saul do that? From a careful reading of the passage, um, there was a moment later on in this chapter where it says that the Hebrew men were losing heart. Um, apparently, the during this time, even the time of uh, Samuel being a judge over Israel, um, the Philistines had the pretty much had their neck, had their boot on the neck of the Israelites. And um, so to the point to where they did not even have a, a, a an ironsmith in the land. So him saying, blowing a trumpet saying, let the Hebrews hear that the king is here to defend them. Um, although it's still a little bit odd to hear this being said, seeing how in the previous couple of chapters that Saul and Jonathan smote uh, Saul and Jonathan smote the um, <clears throat> uh, the previous enemy from the previous chapter and wiped them out pretty good. So uh, Saul and Israel heard the news that Saul had smitten the garrison of the Philistines, although it was actually Jonathan that did it, and also that Israel had become odious to the Philistines. The people were summoned to Saul at Gilgal. Now, in hearing of this great victory that Jonathan had, that Saul took credit for, that now the Philistines assembled to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen, and people like the sand of the seashore in abundance, and they came up and camped in Michmash east of Beth Haven. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because it's pretty simple to explain, but an expression where you hear it said that something was as numerous as the sand of the seashore, 
that is what you call hyperbole. Um, now most of you know what hyperbole means, but what it just simply means is a great number, a great number more than the other side has, and to the point to where um, the people were intimidated, they were afraid. That's all you need to know about that. So at verse 6, when the men of Israel saw that they were in a bind, for the people were hard pressed, and the people hid themselves in caves and thickets and cliffs in cellars and in pits. So you're going back to verse 3, we see that this is what is the case. That um, we see that um, the people of Israel are afraid because over the course of the last 30 to 50 years during this time when everybody did what was right in their own eyes, the first part of Judges where Samuel comes up, we see that um, God had forsaken Israel. Just like he's fixing to forsake the good old United States of America. No matter who wins the presidency in 2016, no matter who the governor of whatever state is, people in America are no good for the most part. Now you do have a remnant in the church in America of which part of that is actually biblically and theologically pursuing God. The people in the other churches, as I've said before, are decent people, but are they saved? Well, that's a good question. Are they saved? Where are they? Why are they showing up to church on Sunday morning and then leaving an hour and a half later, having nothing more to do with the church the rest of the week, doing nothing in their communities? Um, does, is, that, is that what the Bible calls the fruit of the Spirit, that you would know them by their acts of faith? Well, at any rate, here we have Israel, who is been forsaken by God to the point where he's allowed the Philistines to pretty much have their boot on their neck. The some of the Israelites crossed the Jordan into the land of Gad and Gilead, but as for Saul, he was still in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. Well, all the people that were left followed him trembling. Many of them had departed. Now verse 8, he waited seven days according to the appointed time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from him. So Saul said, Bring me to me the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. So he hadn't quite gotten to the peace offerings yet. But as soon as he had finished the burnt offering, Samuel shows up. And Saul went out to meet him and to greet him. But Samuel said, in verse 11, what have you done? And Saul said, because I saw that the people were scattering from me and that you did not come within the appointed days and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash. Therefore, I said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal and I have not asked the favor of the Lord. So... I took it upon myself, forced myself, and offered the burnt offering. Now, there is never going to be a time, no matter what is going on, in the history of God's will on this earth, that it is ever going to be okay, no matter how well-meaning the king is, for him to go ahead and assume a Levitical office task and offer a burnt offering, a peace offering, or whatever kind of offering. It is never okay no matter what the situation is. It is never okay no matter what's going on. But, as we'll continue to see in this chapter and in other chapters, that Saul was a fool. And this is the same guy, you know, you remember that we saw when it came time for him to be anointed publicly, that he was hiding amongst the luggage. This guy who's six foot five inches tall, who's bigger in stature, the Bible says that he's a good looking guy. He's got no reason to be insecure in himself. 
just been anointed king out of the blue nowhere. And here he is hiding amongst the luggage. Now here he is making a foolish decision. But Samuel said, what have you done? In verse 13, Samuel said to Saul, you have acted foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not endure. The Lord has sought out for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has appointed him as ruler over his people because you have people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. And Samuel arose and went up from Gilgal to Gibeah of Benjamin, and Saul numbered the people who were present with him about six hundred men. So this is the number that's left after the number that have fled. Six hundred men. Now, verse 16, Saul and his son Jonathan and the people who were present with them were staying in Geba of Benjamin while the Philistines camped at Michmash. And the raiders, or those who've come to take the spoil, came from the camp and the Philistines and three companies, one company turned toward Ophrah to the land of Shuol and another company turned toward Beth Horon and another company turned toward the border, which overlooks the valley of Zeboim toward the wilderness. Yeah, and that's pronounced Zeboim. Verse 19, Now no blacksmith could be found in all the land of Israel, for the Philistines said, Lest the Hebrews make swords or spears. So all Israel went down to the Philistines, each to sharpen his plowshare, his mattock, his axe, and his hoe. Now, this verse could be kind of confusing having read it the first, second, or third time. And you really kind of need some extra biblical aids in order to be able to get it in the proper context. The situation between the Philistines and Israel was not warlike. It was like an occupation where the oppressor lived in the land, controlled a lot of the land and even enforce some of their laws on the land kind of like Israel during the time of Jesus with the Romans so this verse 19 is inserted in this text put in this text to just indicate the fact that the Israelites really did not have the kind of weapons that they needed in order to be able to fight this war now Saul had men but he really didn't have the proper weapons. So, in verse 19, the rendering here, to translate it, would be best to say, No blacksmith could be found in all the land of Israel, for the Philistines said, Lest the Hebrews make swords or spears. So when they needed to, in terms of their occupations as farmers, he's elaborating on this. He's elaborate, he's, he's, he's simply informing us that the Israelites did not have the proper weapons to fight this war against the Philistines, which is part of the reason why they're so fearful. So we know from verse 19 that they, there were not many swords or spears amongst the Israelites. He goes on to elaborate and says, when the Israelites went down, when they needed something sharpened, they, they had to go to the Philistines and they could only bring their plowshares, their mattocks, their axes, and their hoes. And the charge was two-thirds of a shekel for the plowshares, the mattocks, the forks, and the axes and to fix the hoes. So it came about, verse 22, on the day of battle that neither sword nor spear was found in the hands of any of the people who were with Saul and Jonathan. But Jonathan, Saul, and some of the higher-up men did have them. And the garrison of the Philistines went out to, to the pass of Michmash. Now, I could go on and talk about, give an introduction to verse 14 here, which is what I plan on doing. But there's one thing again I want to highlight, and that is that Saul acts foolishly all throughout verse 13 chapter 13 and as we'll see on into chapter 14 um, uh, the one thing that I would like to 
include here is uh, that there are commentators who say this, and I can kind of see where they're coming from. And I've mentioned this before in previous chapters, that Saul doesn't ever really exhibit a justified by faith position in any of these chapters. He seems to be the kind of person that um, has an intellectual faith in God, but not a, but not a saving faith in God. Um, now, obviously, even as king, with, with Samuel still being around, we know that Saul has spent a lot of time in God's word, because that was the commandment. Uh, so Saul does know enough to be saved. He does know enough to, to have a righteous faith in God. But it's debatable whether or not he knew God in his heart. And so what I always say, because I think it's the, the humble, non-self-righteous way to say this, is we don't know if Saul was saved by faith, but we don't know his heart. And as Christians, when, when self-righteousness is one of our bigger sins that we haven't overcome, we tend to jump to conclusions and say, oh, that guy isn't saved. Um, well, he may be. He may just be showing one of his big sins publicly for you to see. We, we should really try to withhold judgment. If we're, going, if we're growing in grace and humility, we should really try to withhold judgment about whether that person's going to heaven or hell or not. And just simply... Take in what we've just seen, the sinful behavior that we've just seen, the doubt that we've just seen, and take it for what it is and try to adjust what we're doing in ministry accordingly to where everybody is uh, moving forward with the ministry of that given church. Um, and I think that that's the, where you want to leave that. Um, uh, and we're, we're going to see more examples of this in chapter 14. But one thing that chapter 14, that we're going to see more examples of, of Saul acting foolishly with, with, with no faith at all and so forth and so on. Uh, but the one thing I want to point out about chapter 14 that I think is pretty important is that it makes pretty clear that, that Jonathan does live by faith, that John do, Jonathan does act out of faith. Which is why he just does his own thing without waiting for his father. Because he probably... Now, I'm reading into the text. I'm not going to say that. I just know that in this next chapter that he goes off on his own accord. Makes his own decision out of faith, out of trust in God. And Jonathan definitely seems to project a saving faith in God. A relationship with God. He's obviously gotten because his father has, you know brought him up in the scriptures because Saul was obviously in the scriptures because that was the mandate for the king that he had to be in the Bible he had to be in the Old Testament and um, and as a result of it Jonathan does some really great things but the main point that I want to bring out is that just because the father uh, lacks so much faith doesn't mean the kids are going to turn out that way and just because the parents have great faith in Christ doesn't mean the kids are going to turn out that way. So the one thing you want to know from this passage when you're hearing it, if you're a parent, is don't blame yourself if you do the best that you can raising your children in a Christian home. Don't blame yourself for um, if your kids turn away. It, it isn't your fault. In the same way as the gospel is meant to be proclaimed and if people reject it, you know, it isn't our fault that people reject it. We should not take the rejection personally until we don't do it. Um, in the same way, parents' obligation is to bring their kids up in the fear of the Lord, to set the example for them, but the kids don't aren't necessarily going to follow. Your kids could turn to be some of the worst kids ever. So, don't blame yourself. Because that is sinful, in a way. In a sense, it is sinful because parents have spent so much time feeling sorry for themselves and blaming themselves for their kids not turning out to be great people of faith that they it 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 holds them up and holds them back in what they're supposed to be doing in ministry they spent so much time feeling sorry for themselves and groping around that they aren't 
running the race anymore. They've, they've stopped. They're stuck in neutral, uh, worried about their kids. Let it go. Give it up to God. Let your kids, pray for your kids that they would turn around. But do not blame yourself. If you could look back and say that you did the best you could, honestly, then you are a great parent. And don't ever call yourself, don't ever, don't ever think that you're not a great parent. You probably are. I mean, the very fact that you, the very fact that you are so upset about it and somber about it, it's a pretty good indication that you're a great parent, that you did your job. So, um... I think that that concludes this passage. I hope that everybody, within the sound of my voice, uh, got a good uh, teaching out of it. I pray that the Holy Spirit would give clarity to the ears that hear this passage. And I pray that the Lord Jesus would add uh, faith and grace and humility to all of our hearts. We pray for the persecuted church. We ask that God would uh, provide everyone with sufficient food for the day, sufficient water for the day, clean water. I pray that we would all be encouraged and that we would be helping one another. Whenever you see someone who needs the slightest bit, no matter how small assistance, give them a hand. Because not every task in a job is a one-man job. People need someone to open up the door for them. People need someone to pick something up for them. Their back may be sore. Do the little things in, in your day to help others out. And do it unto God's glory. And Father God in heaven, we, we thank you for this message. We thank you for this time to spend in your word. And we learn from Saul that um, to not do things hastily, that even when the enemy is bearing down on us and everything appears to be falling apart, we do not violate your statutes, your, uh, your laws, your rules, your commandments, just because it seems expedient to do so. All Saul needed to do was just to sit there and get on his knees and pray and ask God for deliverance. Not assume a Levitical priestly office task. All Saul had to do was get on his knees and pray and fast. There are other things he could have done to communicate with the Lord, but he didn't. So it's because he wasn't a very spiritual man. So Father, we ask that you would not that you would help us to learn from his not so good example, his bad example, and to do better, to do what we should have done in this situation. And to Christ then we pray, Amen.